So welcome to the final of this series of talks and in this we're just going to talk through a series of 20 different cases that have got a learning point with each one. Uh, you can keep the audio on or off if you find it's unhelpful and you want to do it much more to your own time with no prompt. Um, you can just do it silently because some of the learning points are actually written on a slide after it so if you want to do it on silent that's fine. Case one is an alcoholic presenting after a fall down a flight of stairs uh, and you perform a trauma examination. So hopefully it's clear to you and uh, the left and this is an atelectic, atelectic tatic left lung that's floating around in this fluid in his left chest and when we move below the diaphragm we can see he's not only got fluid in his chest but also ascites here. On the right side we can see a um, liver that's a little bit shrunken um, and uh, is contributing to that and looks a little bit like a, a spleen on this side. And on this side, it's not to be confused with thinking that this is a pericardial effusion. This is actually a pleural effusion on the left side in which the heart is bobbing around and, and wobbling around within that um, pleural effusion. Uh, sometimes you need a little bit more clarity, but in this context, it's not a pericardial effusion. Um, case one learning is that fluid doesn't always equal blood. So in this case, this was um, ascites and a pleural effusion. Um, we need to think about um, what images aren't present and how do you complete your examination. Um, I need to answer all the questions about whether there's fluid in the chest, whether there's fluid in the abdomen, fluid around the heart and whether you can see lung sliding. Case 2 is a 26 year old who presents after a motorcycle accident and uh, he's got effectively almost normal vital signs. This is looking at left lung. Um, this is one of the most ones that some people will get confused about, but you're getting a slight shadowing of pericardium adjacent to that lung sliding on the left side. Right upper quadrant, this is unfortunately inadvertently, they've used the zoom here, which is why you're not seeing all the field of view in our classic sense. As is the left upper quadrant. And this is looking at subcostal pericardium. To modify it from there, um, what we've got is um, a parasternal long axis view. Um, and there's an absence of a uh, pericardial effusion. And this we'll use when we, we can't see great views on the subcostal approach. When we look at the pelvis and trans and longitudinal, there's no free fluid. So I suppose the key questions is, we're, after a trauma, um, it'll tell you about free uncontained uh, fluid, but you can still have significant fractures and solid organ injuries that are contained. So don't consider that an EFAS does not equate to injury. Um, so a negative EFAS does not mean there's nothing going on with your patient. Um, it just gives you a guide of the severity of the injuries that he may have and a guide to whether they're going to need early surgical intervention. Case three is a 24 year old who presents with pelvic pain um, with last period being six weeks ago. Uh, so to orientate you, if you haven't already, and I apologise to those who are on a silent run through who won't hear me anyway. This is bladder, this is uterus, and this is free fluid posterior to uterus, and this is peritoneum with some bowel floating within that. Case in point is that you can use your EFAS to detect other reasons why someone might have peritoneal free fluid. Um, in non-trauma cases as we talked before. 
Case 4 is a 34-year-old who presents after a cycling accident this time, um, being a little bit to Kipnik. So this is just one of those cases that when you're um, looking at lung, uh, just a, a learning point, it's quite useful to anchor your hand um, to the chest wall rather than hold um, the transducer without your hands touching the patient. Because what's happening here is as the patient breathes, um, we're getting a little bit of movement in these tissues with respect to the transducer. And what that can do in more subtle cases, it can make it much, much harder to see whether you've got lung sliding here. Whereas if you anchor your hand to the patient, what's gonna happen is you're gonna move with the patient as they breathe, and then you're less likely to have that um, movement within the soft tissues, and you can really focus in on that pleural line. So this is just for what it's worth, so you're aware. This is what a rib shadow can be. And a way that you could avoid that potentially is potentially trying to rotate your transducer and try and drop it into that space a little bit better. And you might be able to see above that spleen just that tiny bit better. So think about what questions remain unanswered, what areas haven't we scanned. Um, if you need to use a checklist or a reporting checklist, um, make sure you do so. Sometimes images are difficult, um, and if you need to say inconclusive left upper quadrant views, then make sure you reflect that in the report. Um, if you can't get crisp images, I still tend to record the inconclusive image to show that I've remembered to do it. I just had inconclusive. Um, views because of patient factors, whatever they may be. Um, the other thing, uh, just bef previously, you can clearly see that this case, they forgot to get the labels right, and so it's not a transverse pelvis and long. The way you're less likely to run into that problem is if you label before you change. But we're, we're all human, we can all make errors. So long as we learn from them, um, we'll get better. So 41 year old who uses methamphetamine um, and has developed a, a, an addiction and gets assaulted. So we're looking at his left anterior lung here. And there's a couple of things that I just want you to point out to you know, if you haven't got used to sort of slightly pathological lungs. These laser like beams coming from the pleural surface are what are known as B lines and they um, reflect edema that's happening within the lung um, or increased fluids within the uh, lung at the pleural surface. And the most common reason for that, uh, if it's everywhere, is um, cardiac failure. So let's look at the pericardium. Um, within our EFAST examination, we're not seeing a significant pericardial effusion. This is just a modification on the pericardial effusion, but um, to orientate you, right ventricle, left ventricle, left atrium, and your aortic valve, mitral valve. Uh, looking at things, this is his right upper quadrant. Should optimize our depth better here because we've lost diagnostic information or lost useful screen space down here, um, got some contact dropout and rib shadows. And this is a renal cyst that's sitting here. So this anechoic structure within the re renal parenchyma is actually a renal cyst. However, if we track that liver tip, this is where you are. Even in the presence of this rib shadow that's causing it difficult, um, one should persist and make sure you've tracked down that liver tip. Now we use a completely non-standard view, but we're still seeing that free fluid. That's free fluid. 
again. Not the best use of depth. But we're not seeing free fluid on the left upper quadrant. And a little bit inconclusive with a, a, an empty bladder, this guy. So you've got um, symphysis pubis with its shadow behind it in here. And this is probably bladder, but this could also be free fluid and actually has some features that makes it look a little bit pointy like free fluid uh, sitting down around here. But when we look in trans, it looks much more like bladder. And this is his urethral depression uh, in a male patient that we're going to see. So sometimes it's not stick the transducer on and people's anatomy is like that of a 20 year old. So keep looking if you're suspicious. And hopefully you could see that that left ventricular squeeze was pretty awful. Uh, so this per poor person has a meth heart along with his new diagnosis of um, uh, peritoneal free fluid. Um, now the peritoneal free fluid could be heart failure related, um, but we need to assume that it's due to his injury in the right context. Um, the, in the clinical information that we get from his cardiomyopathy is all obviously relevant if he needs to proceed towards general anaesthetic and special considerations and caution in around that time. An 80 year old fall against the kitchen table with tenderness in their left upper quadrant. So this is right lung, their left lung. This is gallbladder and hopefully you can see that it's rounded in its, its edges. But when we look tightly at Morrison's pouch, hopefully we can see this pocket here. And that um, is, like we said, um, fluid is pointy. And in this context, this fluid is pointy. So pointy fluid is more concerned for, or more concerning for pathological states. Whereas if it's got sort of rounded edges, it may be within a structure that's um, There, and then when, if we scan a little bit later again, and waited a sh relatively short period of time, that subtle free fluid is now no longer subtle. That um, uh, pointed bit of fluid is very obvious. One might suggest that the left upper quadrant, where it's actually, we're actually concerned about, um, there's not free fluid. You can actually, um, you could get a little bit concerned about just here, but right at that interface, what you want to see is rather than this just thin line, you want to see it going in a little bit more pointy way. So I wouldn't conclusively say there's free fluid on the left side. Look at the pelvis and long, we don't see anything. Um, so the take home from this is that site of fluid does not equate to where you've injured. So you may have a splenic injury on the left and see the free fluid on the right side. And if you're not sure, repeat it. You're not going to expose them to additional ionizing radiation. At worst, you've got a little bit of gel on them and you've used a bit of time. In this, they didn't do transverse pelvic views and they didn't look at pericardiums and lung bases. So it's an incomplete examination and so you can overlook things. Um, and it's an important take home in trauma. Once you see one injury, you should pause and look for the next one. So we've got a very natural human nature when we see one injury to just anchor on that and focus on that. But remember, if you see one abnormality, make sure you've looked elsewhere because if you've got one, you're much more likely to have another. Case seven is a 26 year old who's found at the festival toilets, which um, vomit stains on his clothes. It's unclear whether they've been assaulted, had a accidental fall or it's just intoxication. But you do hear some crepitations on his left chest. So this is R2 corresponds to right anterior chest um, and L1 uh, corresponds to left anterior chest. And what I want you to try and do is try and see where you see the rib shadows on this and define the rib, sh the rib shadows to orientate yourself to find that pleural surface. And here we see why we couldn't see rib shadows because this, this is a rib with its shadow which means that this rib can orientate ourselves, that this is the pleural surface. And actually we can see lung sliding here. And then suddenly more superficial in the subcutaneous tissues, 
we're seeing this that's creating all this shadowing behind, but not this um, rib type shadowing, this other shadowing behind here. and can't see anything in the far field from this. And this is what surgical emphysema looks like. And it may not be due to a pneumothorax, this was actually due to a maxilla facial injury, but his tracking surgical emphysema came down to his um, chest wall. Case eight is an 80 year old who falls off a ladder cleaning the gutters. Again, especially important from the previous case, I'd just like to orientate. You're seeing rib, rib with its shadow, so you can very clearly see where pleural surface is. So hopefully you're seeing something abnormal here at the tip of the liver. And go across to the left and we're not seeing anything. Oh, I would tell a lie. We're seeing a little something just above that spleen. Here, look in for that spine sign starting to appear there. Uh, so again, not seeing above bladder here, it's just a static image and transverse. So the key thing with this is to look at the liver tip. So you'd see it's positive for peritoneal fluid at the liver tip and actually we had a small amount of pleural fluid there as well, which we assume is due to their trauma until we can prove otherwise. So case nine is a five-year-old who falls off monkey bars. Looking at right and left lungs. Sorry about the static image as opposed to the clip. With right and left upper quadrants. Again, need to get better at optimizing this depth. This it should be changed to, so that this more completely fills the screen. This should be down here. And pericardial views. So I think it's important to understand that there's controversy about the utility of EFAST in children. Um, there's been published literature to say, say that EFAS doesn't change anything you do. Personal anecdote would um, go against that. Um, and it should be regarded as an enhanced clinical examination, but it is not a referral diagnostic test. It is CT is far superior and actually um, contrast enhanced ultrasound shows great promise in terms of um, its use in children, but uh, contrast ultrasound isn't uh, currently widespread or licensed in Australia. Um, so to address this controversy, consider um, ultrasound use and trauma in children as enhancing your clinical examination, but it's not to replace anything else. Um, solid organ injuries um, uh, can be present in, with a negative EFAST, and equally you can have a very positive EFAST that is managed conservatively, for instance, in splenic injuries. So we tend to try and avoid um, splenic um, surgery in children. However, within that, I think you still get useful clinical information. It's just how much you do with it and what way you use it is um, the important thing. Case 10 is a 65 year old who, who tries to break up a knife fight. His blood pressure of 70 is systolic and lung sliding is seen both sides. So, so our next concerning place. So to give you an idea, this is all pericardial effusion. This is left ventricle, right ventricle, and his aortic root, his aortic valve is just sitting here. And you can see this swaying within this effusion and this person's got evidence of tamponade and needs to have, in the context of a penetrating chest injury, needs to have his chest opened. Um, and that's a decision uh, that's gonna be challenging depending on where you're seeing and encountering this patient and what equipment and resources you have available to you. So a large pericardial effusion with evidence of tamponade. Case 11, it's a 30-year-old motorcyclist um, versus kangaroo. 
just a little bit over gained, but within that, um, that's all right. You can actually see a ureteric jet just here, so that's his ureter draining into his bladder. But we've got a problem here in that this is just so over gained here that we could have subtle amounts of free fluid sitting within here um, and it's just being um, hidden within this overgained image. So we need to improve our overall gain and most notably our TGC in this field so that we can better outline whether this is pathological or just incidental. Um, just remember, um, blood vessels are black too. Um, and you're going to most commonly see them out here in the context of your iliacs. Um, and sometimes as they'll, you move inferiorly, they're going to come more superficial. So don't confuse um, iliac vessels for pathological processes. So we've got yet another person who's been assaulted for no reason, 20 year old. Um, look at their left anterior chest, right anterior chest. right upper quadrant, left upper quadrant, noting that we've got some contact to drop out here. Longitudinal pelvis and transverse pelvis, static images in this case. So the take home with this is that this is a, not a positive left upper quadrant view. This is a left upper quadrant view of the stomach. So remember we um, talked about pointy versus rounded edges. Hopefully you can see that this has a rounded edge, not a pointy edge. So pointy equals free fluid. Round equals contained fluid. And what this is, is this is a beautiful picture of bubbles within a beer filled stomach. Case 13 is a 50 year old who falls down a flight of stairs with a rigid abdomen but mostly tender in the uh, left upper quadrant. Right lung, left lung. Again that lung sliding would be improved by letting your wrist and hand anchor to the patient because we've got some transducer movement relative to the chest wall when they breathe. Unfortunately, this shadow here is creating some issues with shadowing uh, that we can't see in this far field. However, the right upper quadrant, I would suggest to you, is fairly conclusive. So are we going to do the left upper quadrant? Or where else do we need to scan? So we've seen lung sliding bilaterally. Might not have examined lung bases terribly well. But we've answered the question about peritoneal free fluid. So pelvic views um, are not going to tell us anything further, nor is left upper quadrant views. Free fluid in the peritoneum is free and it can um, move all across the peritoneum and it's a secondary finding of injury but is not organ specific. So peritoneal fluid stop but do scan your other compartments and look around where they are. Case 14 is a 30 year old motorcycle accident for retrieval um, by air for a femur fracture and he's also got some left sided rib fractures but his initial chest x-ray was normal but you decide to scan his lungs. So this is looking at the right upper zone, the left, left upper zone, sorry. So whilst the initial start of this was a static image, this is actually a clip. So we move a little bit lower down the chest on the right side. And scan the left side. Admitting there's some contact drop out here. You'll sometimes get that with thinner patients. But the key thing with this in terms of his lungs is that um, an anterior pneumothorax may be invisible on chest x-ray, especially a supine chest x-ray. Um, 
Um, bearing in mind there are other reasons for absent lung sliding. Um, but if we saw no lung sliding right round the side and all round that lung, it could have been that his pneumothorax was really small at the beginning and as time's progressed it, it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And that's going to be a big deal when he's going for air transport because it's going to, um, that pneumothorax is going to get bigger as they ascend um, and may cause problems. So you may well need a preemptive chest drain uh, before you travel. And I certainly would want to do that because an in flight chest drain wouldn't be, uh, I think, anyone's preference. Case 15 is a six year old who falls off monkey bars, persistently crying with a tender left upper quadrant. So, let me just pause at the peritoneal findings. So that's his right over quadrant view. Um, and for the purposes of this, his pericardium and thoracic, um, in other words, he had pleural sliding and no pleural fluid, but it was sent to the pediatric surgical registrar by a colleague of mine um, who advised this highly competent doctor that it wasn't concerning and this was not diagnostic. Um, but fortunately, they um, persisted significantly and the splenic laceration was confirmed, but the, the surgical um, doctor involved didn't have the good grace to, to apologise for his behaviour. But it's not all about trauma. Um, sometimes you get other cases, um, and we talked a little bit about some other ones um, previously. So a 24-year-old with pelvic pain with a last period um, seven weeks ago, sometimes you can't get an HCG straight away but you can perform an ultrasound straight away. If you see this amount of free fluid, you should be very concerned that there's a large amount of blood within this person's tummy. Uh, and when you look in the pelvis, as we, it happens, we see just a lot of heterogeneous debris within this and the uterus is hard to define, bladder being here. But don't worry about defining um, where the ectopic is or what the pathology is. The key finding is that they have free fluid. Um, ruptured ectopics usually will cause a significant amount of free fluid, but more advanced scanning is required to assess the uterus and locate the ectopic. And sometimes it's not an ectopic. You may have an intrauterine pregnancy and their free fluid may be caused by an ovarian cyst. But that still sometimes needs operative intervention and may well need um, acute gynecological review. So... In the context of all those, this was originally written for ED, um, you could be assisting anyone in the community, um, for instance, someone with palliative ascites that you're deciding whether you're going to tap in the community. Um, and they clearly have a lot of ascites. But when we look in the left iliac fossa, you can imagine if we put the needle in here, we're going to get really close to these loops of bowel. And maybe that's not the best place to tap. So maybe if we come over to the right side, we can see we've got a much greater margin for error for where our needle goes in on that right side. So lots of ascites, but um, you can choose your best spot and deepest pocket. And you can also use it to assess flow of vessels within the abdominal wall where they may have dilated collaterals, which is un disappointing to, to hit with a needle. And sometimes it's a little bit subtle with people with dark skin. Case 18, so a 40-year-old presents with left pleuritic pain, chest x-rays suggesting consolidation and effusion, and you're deciding whether you should drain it. Or one. So these labels, R1 to 4, are scanning various different zones of the lung. And what we're seeing on L4 is a very large effusion. In fact, it's quite surprising with this size of effusion why we didn't see it in the other zones. But nonetheless, um, this is a very... And what we also see within this, this isn't lung. This is actually a strand of um, debris within this effusion. So not only does it look like an effusion, but it looks like an exudate. Um, Bear in mind there are other causes that are non-traumatic causes of thoracic fluid um, and as we said um, debris within the um, fluid suggests an exudate and when we go through zones one two three and four and i've actually for the most part i would typically truncate it to zones one two and four you've done a 
systematic lung examination for the vast majority of focused lung examinations. Case 19 is a 62 year old with shortness of breath, hypertension and tachycardia. The cardiac uh, shadow looks big on chest x-ray. If you have the luxury of working in a hospital but if you're in a GP practice, you're just seeing them with shortness of breath, hypertension and tachycardia. Um, you can use the EFAST to not only assess the pericardium but I would suggest you can also assess lung fields. But in this context, whilst the view's not great because we've got some stomach gas that's getting in the way. Hopefully you see this very large pericardial effusion. You can actually see, just like we talked about debris within um, the pleura, we can see debris within this pericardium. And this was a malignant pericardial effusion. Um, so although the windows are imperfect, um, this patient had a large pericardial effusion uh, with tamponade requiring emergency drainage. And finally, it's just to talk about a case of pneumothorax and talk about uh, the use of imaging modality. So this is the right and the left, and hopefully you can appreciate the lack of lung sliding that's here. Um, and this is just to demonstrate the left M mode or stratosphere sign. So it's lines that are constantly horizontal like this, as opposed to what's, um, sorry, would be considered when it's a non pneumothorax, you get the sandy beach, which is much more granular in appearance like this at a seashore which so you can see plural this is your seashore with your granular beach here and your sea out here so that mode can be used um, but it adds relatively little and i would think you can probably get the vast majority of what you're doing with good b mode imaging as we've said before so that's the end of your cases. Um, you can look at these again after the course or um, reflect upon them and hopefully it'll have been some, of some use. Thanks very much for your time. It's much appreciated and looking forward to seeing everyone on the course.